All right, well, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we're going to get started with another one of our prime lectures. I want to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Colleen Kelly. Uh, she comes to us from the Division of Infectious Disease. Dr. Kelly is one of our own. She uh, went to medical school here at Emory, did her MD and MPH here. Then she left us briefly to go to UCSF for her internal medicine residency, came back to us for her infectious disease fellowship, and she's now on faculty here as an assistant professor, a joint professor, I guess, in the uh, Division of Infectious Disease and also the Rollins School of Public Health. So um, Dr. Kelly has done a lot of great research here, and she's going to speak to us about how to apply for funding uh, the basics of grants. So thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, please stop me and ask any questions because um, a lot of this stuff is probably a little bit foreign to you all and it should be uh, And I don't really think you should be focused a lot on grants as a resident or medical student But you should at least have some idea of what they are in mind I think as you're kind of progressing through your career and why is that because most people I would say not everybody But a lot of people say I want to stay in academics or I want to do clinical work and research work and Unfortunately, the dirty truth is that you have to pay for that. You have to figure out how to pay to do research or how to stay in academics in most situations. There's not traditionally, it depends on your specialty to some degree, which is what we were talking about a little bit before, there's not always a ton of money allocated towards clinical work, teaching, service work especially, meaning you know, serving on committees and creating programs and that sort of thing. So um, at the end of the day, you're typically thinking about how you can get money to do your research um, and protect your time, which is a, a kind of key word in research is protected time, to be able to conduct that research. Um, for those of you that are thinking you want to stay in academics and you might like to have um, research be a significant part of your career, you should start to become familiar with something called a K award or a career development award. There are lots of different kinds of these. The main, probably most common one comes directly from NIH or National Institutes of Health um, that's uh, funding you to develop your research career as an academic um, uh, researcher. Uh, the VA also has a very similar pathway. I think American Heart Association also does for those of you in cardiology, and there may be other foundation type grants that have something similar, but they're all kind of modeled around this NIHK award. Um, so, you know, you're really busy doing clinical work and you should be, that should be your primary focus, learning about how to take care of patients um, because that's where the questions will come from eventually. Um, so thinking about grants now, today, I don't think should be your highest priority, but down the road if you are going into uh, academic general medicine or pursuing a subspecialty, research and grants will become part of that soon. Uh, and the time when grant writing um, should come to the forefront is you've got to have an idea. You have to have something, a clinical question or a research question that you want to pursue. At your stage of the game, mentoring is very, very important. And so you should be figuring out who are good people that I'd like to model my career after. Who are good people that have been successful doing research that I get along with <laughs> and I'm very interested in the work that they're doing as well. And they might be able to help me along to get to you know, come along in a similar pathway. So the mentoring team is very important. I think you guys have had talks about um, what that means to have a mentoring team. And it's also kind of important as you're moving along in your career, if you want to do uh, research, to start thinking about publications. Uh, uh, the ideal thing is to have research-based publications in peer-reviewed journals. But if you don't have that, uh, the next best thing is to think about doing case reports and case series and review articles and that sort of thing. Um, reviewers of grants uh, want to see that you're able to take an idea all the way through to publication because it's a lot of work for those of you that have done it before No, it's easy um, to get started but getting to the finish line is not always the case um, and so depending on where you are in your career now might be a good time it might not be a good time but at least to be familiar with it um, we tell, I changed, I give the same kind of talk a little bit longer to our ID fellows, and that, it says now is a good time for them. <laughs> but for you guys, I think it's not necessarily a good time, but in a few years it may be um, as you begin um, your uh, academic careers or go into subspecialty fellowships. Um, and so there's a lot of different kinds of grants, and they're kind of, they're basically <coughs> broken down into three categories. The first is called institutional grants. And what that is, is um, generally NIH giving a chunk of money to Emory 
that then Emory can dole out to Emory affiliated folks. And so these are things such as T32 fellowships. I'm not sure if you all have heard of those, but a lot of a subspecialty fellows will be, their salary will be paid on these T32 grants that are very competitive. There's also international Fogarty awards um, that are awarded through Emory. And there's also something called the KL2, which is like an NIHK award, but it's awarded through Emory. So you're only competing with folks at Emory, well, and Morehouse and Georgia Tech, but in general, folks at Emory. And so they're, I would say they're probably slightly less competitive, but they can also be very um, competitive as well. Um, there are awards through Emory that you can apply for to generate pilot data, so a small pot of money. Um, to do to get some preliminary data to go forward to do bigger money and those are things like the EMCF which is a Grady specific award for junior faculty the URC award which is um, through Emory University is good for the whole university I'm ID and so I'm very ID focused but the CIFAR which is the Center for AIDS Research um, uh, generally has a ton of money to uh, help folks move along and there are probably other type grants in your area of interest that um, would be uh, appropriate to look into as time goes on. So there's institutional grants and then there's foundation grants. So these are organizations outside of academia that make awards to academia to do research. Uh, and the best way I found to figure out whether there's something like this that you might be eligible for is just to Google it. So whatever your area interest of it is, be it cardiology, hemonc, ID, whatever, find out the foundations that are funding research in your area and just look through their web pages and see what kinds of things there's awarding. So this is just a list of the ID ones. Um, I wasn't going to like take my time and go <laughs> look at every single specialty. But you know, drug companies are a good place. So BMS has one that our fellows usually get every year, although they're not BMS anymore, but that's another story. Our uh, professional society, so IDSA, um, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, tropical medicine, just you know, insert your area of interest and start looking at some of these various societies. Uh, in cardiology, the American Heart Association gives a ton of money, um, and Emory folks are usually fairly successful at getting that. So those are the things that I would look into. These also, though, can be just as competitive as any other type of grant, so it shouldn't mean that these are less competitive. And then finally, there's the kind of um, gold star NIH grants, so the um, you know, the, I think the thing that every academic researcher is striving for is to get independent NIH funding. If you're a, at the VA, the VA has a separate, very similar um, um, pathway to the NIH, but it is separate out, uh, separated out into VA, VA reviews. Uh, and at the NIH level, there are um, grants for each stage of your career. So there's fellowship awards when you're a fellow. There's career development awards, which is when you're a junior faculty member, and I'm um, on one of these right now. And then there's the larger awards that the more advanced um, career scientists are getting. And this is the coveted R01 award. So when you hear someone's an R01 funded researcher, it means they progress to the level of getting one of these very large, usually millions of dollars of award grants. Um, they've been successful at getting one of those to fund their research programs. And then there's even bigger awards, like P awards and U awards. But um, you can kind of peruse at NIH website if you're interested in kind of learning more about these, but I don't think it's essential at this stage of the game. And so as I was saying, in general, and these are NIH, there's an award for each stage of your career. So if you're at the medical student um, uh, level, which I, don't, I know very few medical students unless they're focused uh, primarily on research, if they've taken like a time off more than just the discovery period, but if they've taken like a year or two off to do research, they may be eligible for these awards. There's training awards when you're in, uh, mostly fellowship, I'm not aware of anybody being able to do this during residency because you have to have a significant amount of time to go to research. And then there's faculty awards and junior faculty awards and then more senior faculty awards. And eventually the goal is to get you to an independently funded career. And that's where those independent PI awards uh, come in. And that's where the R01s, the P's, and the U's come into uh, play. And so usually what happens is you kind of get into your fellowship or your post-residency um, academic career and you say, you know what, I'd really like to look at X. And then you say, well, who's going to help me do this? You build your mentoring team, you build collaborators and co-investigators around you that say, you know what, that's a good idea, I agree with you, we should move this forward. And then you typically will seek out some small pot of money, some pilot money, um, to generate preliminary data. So you might go one of those institutional awards or you might apply to one of the Emory specific awards and get 
10, 20, $30,000 to generate some preliminary data to say, you know what, my idea is a good one, and now you should give me $5 million to do the rest of it. <laughs> and so eventually then you're going on to NIH or other large foundation awards. Some of the foundation awards can be very large. I recently heard one that was like $20 million. So granted, that went to a huge consortium. But at the same time, they, you know, NIH is not the only big funder. Obviously, Gates and people like that give very large amounts of money. Um, this kind of progression is certainly not absolute, um, especially with the uh, training awards. You don't necessarily have to have a ton of pilot data or preliminary data to apply to these training type awards. Um, and there's a lot, plenty of examples, you know, in our in own institution, probably people you've worked with that like basically jumped straight ahead and went to the last step without doing any of the in-betweens. I don't know how they did it, but there's definitely examples of that. And if you want it, then that's what you should go for. Um, so I've said this word K award or career development award a lot, and I, like I said, if I think you're interested in staying academics, you'd like to research to be a significant component of what you do, you need to familiarize, familiarize yourself with what these are because institutions, Emory included, but other institutions you might be applying to are going to be very focused on you getting a K award. And why? The reason why is because it pays 75% of your salary for up to five years. And once you get into the faculty position, it becomes very important who's paying for your salary. If you're getting 30% from clinical time, where's the rest of the 70% coming from? Or even 50% clinical time, where's the rest of it coming up from? And as I said, there, there is money associated with teaching um, and administrative, but it's generally smaller pots of money. Uh, and so that's why the K awards are so um, coveted. It's a two-part application where you're not only uh, proposing a research idea, but you're also proposing a career development plan. I am this fantastic clinician. I know everything there is about clinical medicine, but I'm not the best researcher yet. And this is, these are the steps I'm going to take to get there. And that's what these war awards are designed to do, is develop you into an independent researcher. What do I need to do in order to get me to that independent large grant um, award? Um, again, the, there are institutional K awards, there's NIH awards, and then I said VA has its own kind of pathway that kind of mirrors this, but it's something different. And if you do want to familiarize yourself with it, um, this NIH key K kiosk is a great place to start looking around and being and looking into what might I be eligible for. So something called a K23, which is what I'm on, is a patient-oriented career development award because I actually enroll patients into studies. But folks are doing more laboratory-based or more epidemiology-based stuff that don't actually enroll people into studies are not eligible for that award, and they have to choose a different one. Um, so it, it does take some work to understand what all these things are. So um, any questions with that so far? <laughs> it's really just a kind of a brief overview to get you familiar. So you know, it seems like how would I even begin to do this? This, this is crazy. I'm not even sure where this, where I would start with this. And I think if you're thinking that now, it's good. That's the right place to be. I think it's not really until you've had some time to start thinking about research ideas and research career where this is something that you should, you know, prioritize. Um, but if you do get to that point in the next couple of years, it really starts with an idea. And sometimes it's your mentor who gives you an idea. Sometimes you come up with an idea on your own and it gets refined with your mentor. Some combination thereof is probably the best thing. And it takes a lot of time to be able to do this. So a lot of reading, everything in the field, you will become an expert on your ideas, a lot of thinking. And a lot of this is just downtime. I think, you know, as residents, we're all like going from here to there, you know, very, very logically and sometimes very chaotically. Um, to, to get things done, and this really is taking a step back and thinking about what are the important scientific questions you're trying to answer, and that takes a lot of, you know, cognitive abilities that we don't necessarily always have time for when we're residents. Again, the mentoring team is very important. I think you have to be open to various possibilities. Sometimes one person's not the right person. You have to, you know, you have to pair up some people that may come from different fields but both have their own specific expertise that you're going to bring together and to uh, complete your idea. Um, and that's actually more the model that I've followed over the last several years. And then finally, if you are thinking about applying for a grant, the first thing you should do is find a copy of someone who applied for that grant in the past and was successful and say, can I see your grant? And I'm, I'm, there's probably very few people that would ever say no. Um, and if they do, you can tell me to call them because <laughs> it's not really fair. But anyways, um, find a copy of that successful grant, look at it, and I think in most situations you'll say, you know what, I can do this. 
I, I know how to do this. I know how to write about myself. I know how to write about my ideas and put it in here. And I think a lot of times, not only is that good to, for you to understand what the grant's supposed to look like, it's also good to give you some, some idea of where to start. Don't reinvent the wheel ever with a grant. Um, other parts, important parts of a grant are a budget. Um, unfortunately, research is very expensive. That's why the grants can be millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and so creating a budget with your mentor or other experts in this area um, are, uh, is, is an important initial step. That we have something called the RAS, or Research Administration Services, that actually helps investigators do this. I don't think it's necessarily a top priority for you guys to understand that. It takes a long time to prepare a grant. Um, and so I think you just need to really set yourself achievable goals. If you are going to do this, it's kind of like writing a manuscript and you say, okay, this week I'm going to get the introduction done. Next week I'm going to get the methods done. And really setting those achievable goals for you to get them. Um, but if you just sit down and say, I'm going to write a grant today, it will never happen. <laughs> so small achievable goals. And I think that's true for pretty much everything in life, but um, particularly for kind of academic research-based projects. Um, other tips if you are thinking about it or you do find your place uh, self in a place where it's, it's time to start thinking about this. Janet Gross is um, a former PhD academic researcher herself, but now is just a consultant that Emory has, um, that is on faculty now with Emory, that just assists people with writing grants and preparing grants. And she is fantastic. You can find her on Emory Me email. She does a lot of seminar series and things like that. If you watch out, like in the Department of Medicine announcements, you'll see announcements for her seminars. Just attending one of those is invaluable. Working with her one-on-one -on, -one on a grant is um, uh, really, really helpful. I'm actually preparing one right now that I'm going to start working with her on uh, for submission. Um, biostatistics help, which a lot of you probably don't have that expertise, is also essential. And there are ways to get that um, through ACTSI, through CIFAR, through the Department of Medicine. There are ways to get you the biostatistics <coughs> help that you definitely need. Um, and I think uh, that part can't be overlooked in a grant. But know that there are ways for you to get that help. Um, and then finally, a lot of times I think people find that's a little bit surprising. Uh, a lot of these grants require you to write recommendation letters or letters of support. They want to see letters of support from your co-investigators or from a lab that you're going to collaborate with to use services and things like that. And I think the, the ugly, dirty truth in all of this is that you write those letters for yourself and then the other person edits them. <laughs> and I think, I think you don't, uh, it was surprising to me when I got to the stage of the game and fellowship that, that that's actually true. That's how it, how it works. Because I think up to this point now, um, folks have been writing these letters for you in private and you never even see them. And then that changes, you know, does a whole 360 on you <laughs> when you get to um, grants uh, and, and that sort of thing. And again, it takes um, a ton of time. And then finally, I think the last thing I'm going to say is there's something called an NIH biosketch, if you've heard of it or not. Um, this is an abbreviated um, CV or curriculum vitae that um, NIH has a very specific format. You can find it here at that link there. And it's basically five pages, and they want it in a very specific format to see your education, your awards, uh, your publications, and your funding. Uh, and so that is something that you can think about starting to look at and put together uh, in preparation for a grant, because this will be required for every single thing you submit from now till, I don't know, eternity. Um, and so it is an important thing that's a little bit new to folks that haven't done it before. Um, and then I think that's it. After you submit a grant, it gets sent out to a peer review, similar to when you're uh, submitting a, uh, a manuscript. Uh, you get a score, which looks like this, somewhere between one to nine, which is exceptional, nine is poor. Um, and then based on your score and based on what the pot of money is and how you score compared to everyone, oops, everybody else that submitted the grants um, determines whether you'll be successful or not. I would say most grants usually score in the one, two, or three range. So that's really what you're striving for. You're striving for something that's almost perfect in order for it to be funded. Um, and that's it. And so I think I've had quite a few links throughout the PowerPoint and here's some more here to just kind of explain things a little bit better give you some resources to look into, um, but hopefully that was just a brief overview.